In the spring of 1959, the Dalai Lama was rescued from Chinese invasion into Tibet and was able to escape over the past Nangpala to Nepal and from there to India. During the next two years, thousands of Tibetan refugees followed him from the roof of the world down to the northern high valleys of Nepal. On behalf of the International Red Cross Committee, George Hartman travelled to Nepal in 1961 to investigate the local situation of the Tibetan refugees and to report on their state of health. In September, he started as a wandering physician with a small Red Cross expedition from Pokhara in the Takola Valley upwards into the Law District, in the most northerly region of Mustang, near the Tibetan frontier to China. Here on the plateau with an altitude of 4,000 meters, the refugees had pitched their tents, barely out of reach of the Chinese border guard. He registered a total of 8,000 800 Tibetans. At the end of October, they started on the second expedition from Jamasam into the Dolpo region, a most exhausting march over three passes of an altitude of more than 5,000 meters on the northeast side of Taulagiri down into the Barbungola Valley, where they finally found the Tibetan refugee group. The ensuing route to the south again across several high passes down to Dorbatan, was most strenuous because of an early onset of winter. Sherpanima Tenzing was his companion and served as translator and help for the refugees. Nepal, still a magic word for me. These are the first words in his diary. All the following comments on the film are based on his personal notes. For the first six weeks, I have committed myself to remain in Kathmandu at the river Bagmati, surrounded by rice terraces in the whole area of settlement. The landscape is fascinating and of great variety. The town of Kathmandu offers many new impressions, colorful and beautifully proportioned temples with intricate wood carvings on the roof. Compared to India, people are better groomed and appear more cheerful. Comings and goings, it is Sunday, but not perceptibly. I have agreed to work in the Tibetan camp in Jaulakal for the first six weeks because of alarming medical conditions due to inadequate hygiene and lack of healthy nutrition. In addition, I was confronted with deaths of anthrax infections. I invented a method for sterilizing the sheep wool in the incubator at 120 degrees, which solved the problem. Finally, we are ready to start. On August the 16th, early at 7 a.m., the plane is loaded. 88 tins, each containing 22 kilos of cheese, 40 tins of multi-purpose food, and enormous supply to fight the famine in the Takola Valley. The high peaks are draped with heavy clouds, but there is a free downward view to the rice terraces carving around the hills 
which never ceases to fascinate. In Pokhara, everything is again unloaded. Nima Tenzing, with a white cap, takes care of the organization. Grazing animals on the airport field are part of everyday life. In the background, Macha Puchare. <laughs> One week later, the porters are ready to start the journey to the Takola Valley. Fourteen carriers with loads of 50 to 60 kilos, consisting of medical material, a total of 100 kilos of food and personal belongings. We are in fact a little expedition, and not only a Red Cross group. Difficult crossing of the river at the mill through water up to the waist, but at least comfortably warm. The porters are troubled by the current. Nima Dorji gives support with balancing, Nima Tenzing helps them to reach the opposite bank. Next we start a step ascent to Gandawani, a marvelous watershed with a view back to the lake of Pokhara. In tow of Nima is Mr. Pradhan, the physician of the district, always wearing a clear shirt. How do they manage it? <laughs> Four hundred meters of steep descent down to Modi Kosi, a powerful river bringing precious water from Macha Puchare. Climbing the slopes over endless steep steps into the valley of a mountainous jungle to reach Ullere, without the path it would take hours to walk a single kilometer. Yume jungle of large rhododendron woods, the monsoon is still raining, all around the leeches are larking. The best weapon against them is a cigarette. I am smoking continuously and burn the aggressors, a most uncomfortable march to Gorepani Pass. We meet and overtake the first small groups of Tibetans. Descent to Shiga, a village with beautiful stone houses surrounded by fields of corn. There is a big folk festival. 
People are pushing through the crowd to gaze in wonder at the unfamiliar newcomers. The procession leads out to the fields, then the people turn back in a line with dancers, drummers and a kind of trombone players. Cheerful youngsters thrilled to meet the foreigners. The leading dancers sway their bodies to the rhythm of drums, while old women provide the background mood with their low laments. Anapurna One Food for the porters, a meal of barley flour called tsampa, is prepared and served on large metal plates. The river Kaligandaki at Totopani. The Hell Valley is in fact a large green mega canyon. We pass the village Dana. A cretin with a giant goiter. In steep turns, the path leads up through the canyon. The rise is incredibly rapid and exposed and leads over a yawning abyss to dizzy heights. In Switzerland there are hardly any comparable tracks to mountain cabins without fixed ropes. Above Flette, the river expands into a progressively large and flat plateau filled with deposits. View of the Monastery La Jon in the delta of the Kaligandaki. Above the clouds the peak of Daulagiri. Crossing the river to Kuche, a last challenge before we reach our goal. Entrance to Jamison, Drogpa women in front of the door, always at work with the falling spindle. On horseback, the expedition moves very fast up to Mustang and approaches the Tibetan frontier within three days. Here we find the large heavy brown tents of the nomads. Our tent is shaped like the pyramid and provides good space for ordination. Soldiers, lamas and numerable drogpas besiege the forecourt. Here begins the most chaotic consultation session of my medical career. We apply ointments, salves and injections and scatter drugs to the crowd in a manner which actually terrifies. The law of coincidence decides with patients will get the correct treatment for their illness, while others will be slowly wasting away, unaware of their fate. The situation is appalling and almost inhuman. We tackle 100 patients within six hours. The chief delegate of the International Red Cross steps out of the tent to the waiting patients. Everyone wants to see the Amshi. View of the inside of the tent with a barrel of drugs, the sterilizer and the pharmacy. Even a lumbar function was performed here. 
the general state of health is satisfactory. There are no signs of overall malnutrition, nor in fact outright starvation. The predominant diseases are infections of the skin, diarrhea and rheumatic pains. Many of the Tibetans come to visit us just out of curiosity. Rarely we encounter very ill patients. Here a man with an ulcer on the breast, possibly tuberculosis. Consultation in front of the tent. Tashi is translator. Misunderstandings are frequent. An unfamiliar task for the internist, the extraction of a tooth. Frequently children are presented with fever of various origins. A noma child in typical sheep clothing. A girl of plushy or core with a bulged belly due to lack of protein nutrition. A young girl initiated by chronic diarrhea, unfortunately at the point of death. Most frequent and annoying, the lice, Tashi sprinkles snail seed. Large groups of droppers around the tent on the way down from Mustang to Gelung. People are gathering in front of the Red Cross tent as if a European doctor had always been regularly available for consultation. Amazing attentiveness and interest everywhere, the Tibetans are hardly ever distrustful. There are a few very poor people, but I have never met anyone dying just due to starvation. On the way to the south, a lonely family with their few remaining personal belongings. View of the Gompa of Gilong. We meet people threshing. In an upper Takola valley, a sufficient quantity of cereal is produced. However, it does not belong to the people, but to wholesale traders who conclude corrupt deals with the merchants in Tibet and China. This makes it difficult for Tibetans to buy the corn for their nourishment. The condor is gliding over the valley. To the south, the Nilgiri. We start the descent into the sandstone canyon. The track is carved into a rock, a scenery reminding us of the Wild West. A village on the other side of the canyon. Nima Tenzing bringing up the rear of the troop. Back to Jamasam, view of Tauragiri. In the foreground, the very small tent of the poorest family. Nearby, there is another tent of much superior quality, perhaps belonging to a wealthy Kampas family. Meat is set to dry. Nima Dolce is pointing out the marvelous pieces hung up on the line. Another very poor family lives in a cave under the rocks on the edge of the valley. The International Red Cross really should help them with food supplements 
with a disparately need. Stunning beauty of Nilgiri with Grand Barrier. Drogpas are hardworking people. Women with their babies on the back are carrying stands. The outpatient clinic, marked with Red Cross emblem, is a very busy place. Crowds of people always queue up at the entrance. In the courtyard, women sit weaving and spinning wool. Snow covers the mountains, probably down to 4,500 meters, urging me into starting immediately for the Dolpo region behind Daulagiri. On October the 23rd, a chilly but splendid autumn day, we are ready to start. Nima Doji and a few Drogba carriers leave for Kagbeni, then up the slope to the west. Within three hours, we reach Gompa Palag, where some patients get treatment. We see the Torong Pass on the opposite side. And Tibet to the north. Yeah. Large amounts of snow gives us an idea of the difficult trekking conditions ahead of us. We encounter an extensive yak caravan which descends from Dolpo for trade. The last house is in Sangduk. From here we follow a difficult passage across sharp drops of rocks above a canyon. The path is icy. We carve some steps, but unfortunately this does not prevent one of the horses from sliding down into the death trap of a canyon. Only a small amount of the package goods can be saved. Daulagiri covered by fresh snow. The second bivouac at 4,500 meters at the entrance to the Hidden Valley. We are just below Tichela and have to wait for yaks in exchange for the horses. Together with Nima, I seize the opportunity to climb the mountain above our camp. Kangse Peak or Muskang as it is called by the local residents, altitude 5,925 meters. There is an exciting panorama view. This flock of yaks is climbing to Tichela, 5,560 meters, our peak Moscow, 
on the opposite side of the valley. Now we are already on the other side of the pass. Walking through crusts and sheets of frozen water is most unfamiliar to me. Our bed at the riverside is equally cold. Next follows a slowly descending northward march down into the valley which lasts for many hours. A single signpost indicates the direction of Charkabot. Gradually, the vegetation is increasing. The seemingly endless path seriously taxes my endurance. Walking is very difficult for me because of the pain in my legs due to inflammation of my tendons. Finally, the valley turns to the west. We get a glimpse of Charkabot far down. Jarka is a village shaped like a fortress. The inhabitants are threshing corn. We camp on an empty field already harvested. The supply of food gets scarce because we had lost a considerable amount of rice in the canyon. In addition, we definitively need to rent yachts to progress faster on our way. Negotiations are difficult. The village inhabitants are rather unfriendly. Patients turn up early in the morning but treating them is not a rewarding experience. Therefore, we rather enjoy leaving the inhospitable place next morning. The exit from Tsarka leads into a deep gorge. Climbing the slums on the other side is exhausting. We are prisoners of the valley. Finally, after two more days of strenuous walking, we have reached the next village, Kakot, which looks like a nest of ravens. People lead a very meager existence. Some of the children look undernourished. All inhabitants seem to be busy processing wood. The whole Barboncola Valley appears to be much longer than indicated on our charts. The track turns to side valleys in large detours and requires hours of walking. Our porters are much in delay. I have to send Nima back to get the situation under control while I continue on my way down to Tarakot on my own. Here I experience the most humiliating situation of my life. I finally find a dirty place to sleep in a miserable shelter in a half-open shed more suitable for a dog. Above Tarakot, the group of Tibetan refugees we were looking for, about 1,100 people altogether, are already waiting for us. It is unlikely that they will reach Dorpatan this late in the year as there are another three high passes to cross on the way to the south. With a big last effort, our team succeeds in reaching Dorpatan on November the 7th, where the Swiss group of Dr. Kipfer takes care of us. I feel very ill with angina. I am also exhausted with my energy totally depleted. On November the 10th, Pilot Wick brings me safely back to Jamasam, a tremendous flight to the southeast around Taulakia.
Back to Yomasom with the imposing Nilgiri. Tibetan women enter through the door working on the falling spindles. The women are working most of their time in contrast of their men. The smallest loom, approximately half a meter long, is in the courtyard and is used to weave special ribbons. Saula comes through the door with his impressive group of Tibetans. In another house we can watch how prayer flags are manufactured. The black color is a suspension of suit. Flags are printed in all colors. We say farewell to Jamison and to everything we have experienced here. The flight deepens my impression of the gorgeous route along the canyon of the Takola Valley. goes to Daulagiri and Maitokuche Peak. It seems now that someone else will be first to climb this proud and intriguing little peak. It would have been too good to be true if I had been destined to be that first climber. And we are landing again in Pokhara. At the end of the monsoon, there are now 
only a few clouds at Kathmandu. The old city, no motorbikes, no cars, only a few bicycles and only cars. What a contrast to nowadays. We visit the surroundings areas of Akmandu in the direction of Bodnath. The stupa stands on its own in a garden landscape, a dusty driveway where today there is a large road with heavy traffic. We visit the stupa on the gallery some Tibetans no tourists. On the platform of the stupa, a family holds a sacrificial ceremony. We visit Paspatina the center of Hinduism, where the sadhu are part of the scenery. View over the Bagmati River with religious rituals along the bank, both for the living and the dead. Another sadhu. And the impressive entrance to a Hindu temple. Sacrificial altar with dried cow down. In the background, the hill of Swayambunath. At last a visit in Swayambunath, walking up the long stairs of the hill with the holy shrines shared by Hindus and Buddhists. Crowds of people are milling around.
this famous little monkey is with today snatch the rucksack of the tourists. Everywhere we see sacrificial ceremonies. Flowers are presented and taken in by an invisible hand. A ceremony in a family circle. They all hold on to a string and throw grains of rice into the fire. At the back a great number of butter lamps. The remaining of notes were either lost or perhaps never written. George Hartman survived his humanitarian action without obvious out of harms or injury. However, after his return to Basel he became seriously ill with hepatitis and many weeks of recuperation passed until he finally regained his full health. At the end of the year 1961, the Nepalese government decided to stop access to the mountains of Himalaya because of the war between China and Tibet. There was an absolute block of admission of climbers up to the year 1969. When George first heard of the reopening of the Himalaya, he immediately alerted his best mountaineering friends in Switzerland, Alois Strickler, Freddy Hitz and Rudi Homberg to prepare for the expedition to Tokuche Peak, so his old dream was fulfilled after all. The four friends successfully completed the first ascent of Tokuche Peak on May the 10th in 1969.